there are many powerful earth science related activities, data, and processes that one can use inside a geographic information system or GIS environment. All of these let us look at spatial patterns, relationships and trends across the landscape from local to global scale. In this example, let's take a look at sea level rise. We've all seen all sorts of predictions about what would happen if sea levels rose due to a, a global climate warming period. In my GIS, I have a couple of different layers. I've got some country outlines. I've got some sea level and coastline information as well. Let's take a look first at what the coastlines were like 20,000 years ago. The current climate fluctuations are nothing new. Climate's been changing ever since the Earth was formed. Let's zoom into the Caribbean Sea, Central America, Mexico, be nice to have those country names on there. With the GIS I can do that. Okay. I can also change the labels so that I don't have any sort of duplicate labels. I'll do that. That way I'll only have one label for the Bahamas, for example, even though it has numerous islands. Take a look at Florida and the Yucatan Peninsula, for example, and then these coastlines on the eastern shore of Honduras and uh, Nicaragua. They were quite extensive because the shelf there, the continental shelf, is, uh, is, extends out into the ocean quite a bit there. And so 20,000 years ago, uh, this is what we had estimated to be the coastlines. Let's turn on the coastlines for today. Okay, that looks more, more familiar. What about if the oceans rose by five meters? Well, in many places, you don't see much difference. But in other places, for example, South Florida and Louisiana, there's a huge difference. Why is that? Let's go ahead and analyze what would happen if the oceans rose by 50 meters. Wow. We do not have any of the Florida Peninsula anymore, or South Louisiana, or even the Texas coast. What about if the ice cap at the South Pole and Antarctica totally thawed, this is what we'd have. We'd have an estuary across the South Central United States here up the Mississippi embayment. Let's take a look at some of these islands. So what does this show us? Instead of looking at a table of data or reading a paragraph or two, none of which are bad things in themselves, here we can actually investigate the data and look at patterns, relationships, and trends. In another example, also using ArcGIS desktop, I've got the elevation for the continental United States, and actually I have the elevation for a bit more. I've got Alaska, for example, in here as well. And then I'm going to go ahead and map the temperature extremes. I'm sure you've all seen in the newspaper the daily high and low for the United States. What I did was I decided to map all of those. I just mapped one month, January 2009, and I symbolized that with, with ovals, H's and L's. I'm interested to find out what kind of pattern the high and low temperatures for each day in January shows. So here, what kind of pattern do you see? Obviously we've got sort of a northerly trend to the low temperatures in January, but we also have something coming down right into Colorado and Wyoming. Well, if we take a look at the elevation legend, we can see that those areas are higher in elevation, so it makes sense. If you tie that into your lesson on, yes, latitude matters, but also altitude matters. And then we also have this southerly influence of the high and low temperatures with Southern California, South Texas, and South Florida. Now keep in mind this is January. What would it look like in July? If we tracked this, wouldn't we see in sort of an interior migration of these? We would no longer have South Florida being the high temperature in the nation, but rather we'd probably have the Mojave Desert. We'd have a lot of Death Valley showing up, maybe a few in Phoenix. We saw in the continental United States that 
higher elevations had a lot of the low temperatures. But after we zoom up to Alaska, we find that that uh, does not quite hold true, perhaps for a couple of reasons. For one thing, we've got this basin right here that's just to the north of Fairbanks, to the north east of Fairbanks, and we have this large basin here between the Brooks Range and some of these Alaska ranges down to the south, where the cold air sinks and results in some really cold temperatures. I mean really cold. If I use the Identify button on a couple of these points, let's take a look at the data. This is the I part of GIS, the information behind the scenes, and I'm going to look at the Birch Creek community in Alaska. On January 2, 2009, it had a low of 57 degrees F below zero. And then it was minus 64 the next day, and the next day after that, it was minus 65. And actually, all through the month, it set the record. Uh, the lowest it was was on January 10 with minus 68. Not for the faint-hearted up there. So, through this activity, we've seen that we have some pretty identifiable patterns that they change throughout the year also, and that they change in extreme extremes. What other kinds of data could you map that you see in maybe a local newspaper or a national or international newspaper or in a magazine or on the web or in a newscast on the radio or TV every day that you might be able to map and look at patterns? Once we bring that data into a GIS environment, we can really dig into the issues, the, pen, the trends, the patterns behind the data.